I'm Michelle Easton, president of the Claire Booth Luce Center for Conservative Women. And I want to welcome you all to our January Conservative Women's Network Lunch. Special thank you to Bridget Wagner here, representing the Heritage Foundation, a very pro-life group, as well as Claire Booth Luce. Heritage and Luce have had a wonderful partnership on these CWN lunches now for 20 years. <laughs> Today, I'm pleased to introduce our speaker, Kristen Hawkins. At this critical time when life is under attack, we asked Kristen to speak to you today about how we, as conservative women and men, can help promote a culture of life and bring an end to abortion. Kristen is the president of a wonderful organization, Students for Life of America. Under her leadership, she took Students for Life from a small organization with a few dozen chapters to more than 1,200 uh, campuses all across every state in the Union. Students for Life exists to abolish abortion by transforming our culture and recruiting, training, and mobilizing the pro-life generation, which is the direct target of today's abortion industry. Frequent speaker and media analyst, Kristen's expertise includes abortion, feminism, disability advocacy, and health care as she navigates the social conditions and public policy impacting the human rights issues of our day. She's a published author. She wrote Courageous, Students Abolishing Abortion in This Lifetime. She's made numerous TV appearances and speaks at pro-life conventions and events across the US and has spoken on many college campuses, including Yale, Harvard, Dartmouth, and UC Berkeley. She graduated from Bethany College in 2005, uh, studied political science, and before launching Students for Life, she served at the Republican National Committee and as a presidential appointee in George W. Bush's administration at the Department of Health and Human Services. Wasn't that fun, huh? Mm. <laughs> Recently, she served on then-candidate Donald Trump's Pro-Life Advisory Committee. And last June, I was talking with her a little earlier, she gave a wonderful presentation to about 100 women student leaders at a Claire Booth Luce uh, seminar on Capitol Hill. Her frank and very honest <laughs> presentation <laughs> was truly appreciated by the women student leaders we work with at Luce. No holes barred. Excellent. It was excellent. You know, the battle for the lives of unborn children is an emotional one for a lot of people, for sisters and brothers, moms and dads, grandmothers like me and many of you. What a joy it is to look at the sonogram pictures of precious babies. The evil of destroying these children any moment before they are born, as the New York law passed, just a uh, uh, pass allows is incomprehensible to most Americans. A similar law proposed and defeated in Virginia yesterday added more to this gruesome abortionist story when Governor Northam, the Virginia governor who supported this bill, explained in a WTOP radio interview how abortion would work if a mother's in labor because the idea is you can abort the baby any time until it's born. And he said, quote, if a mother's in labor, I can tell you exactly what would happen. The infant would be delivered. The infant would be kept comfortable. The infant would be resuscitated if that's what the mother and family desired. And then a discussion would ensue between the physician and the mother, unquote. I'm guessing Governor Northam must have forgotten that what he is recommending is what the monster doctor, Kermel Gosnell of Philadelphia, was sentenced to life in prison for, killing live babies or leaving them to die after they were born. And Virginia Governor Northam is a pediatrician. What a horror. Happily, over recent years, we've seen more and more people, both young and not so young, shifting over to the side of respecting unborn life. And I know that the work of Kristen Hawkins has been a critical part of the swing of the pendulum. What, what a fine job you do. She says her proudest accomplishment is being wife to her high school sweetheart, Jonathan, raising her four children, and in her free time working for a cure to cystic fibrosis, which two of your children have. Please join me now in a warm welcome for Kristen Hawkins. Yeah, it's been an exciting time in the pro-life movement uh, in the past couple of weeks. Um, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit. And I think, um, you know, I was thinking about what's been going on. Um, 
what we've been seeing in New York and Rhode Island, Vermont, Virginia. Um, and I, I thought a little bit about the tortoise and the hare fable. We homeschool in my family. My, my husband, we actually have reverse roles in my family. Um, and this is a feminist talk, but my husband's a stay-at-home dad. And he homeschools our children. And one of the lessons, uh, the classes that my three – third grader and fourth grader, oh my gosh, take, are fables. And one of the fables that they love is the tortoise and the hare. And I overheard Jonathan talking about the tortoise and hare, explaining it uh, to my oldest son, Gunnar, who just turned 10 yesterday. Yes, I'm that old. I have a 10-year-old. It's double digit. It's bad. Um, but it was interesting when you, when you think about the pro-life movement and you think about the pro-abortion movement, the movement to advance legal abortion in the United States. You know, um, if, if you remember the fable, right, like there's this arrogant hare who, you know, it was a rabbit, by the way. Hare is a rabbit. I had to explain that. That took a while. I forgot we did. I had to explain that in my house. Um, the arrogant hare is taunting the very slow tortoise, um, makes fun of him for being slow, uh, and then challenges to, a you know, and then challenges him. And the tortoise kind of gets upset. And he said, that's it. I'm going to challenge you to a race. And so, you know, the hare takes off, speeds away. And midway through the race, he uh, takes a nap because uh, he realizes, he's like, hey, the tortoise is never going to catch up to me. I'm a hare. He's a tortoise. Um, but when he finally wakes up from his nap, he realizes the tortoise is almost, almost there, almost made it to the destination. So the hare wakes up, gives it everything he can. Uh, to catch up to the tortoise, but still it's not good enough and he fails and the tortoise wins the race, right? Uh, and there's lots of lessons you can learn from that. But I, I think when you, when I think about the pro-life movement, I, this is kind of how I see the pro-life movement of, you know, when Roe and Doe were handed down in 1973, when the Supreme Court wrongly decided against science and human rights, um, this is kind of how the pro-life movement was. We weren't a sophisticated movement. In fact, this kind of came out of nowhere for many people. A lot of people thought, you know, this was going to be reversed. Congress was going to fix this thing. Like, this was just too crazy. Like, people didn't even believe that, oh, my gosh, abortion's legal in all nine months. Um, and so we had, a lot, we had a lot of disadvantages, you could say, as a pro-life movement, right? Uh, we lacked financial resources. We definitely lacked media support. It's actually better today than it was then. Um, and there's a list of things you can say that we didn't have. We didn't have organizations. We didn't, we didn't know what the strategy was going to be. And the early years, if you look at the history, was very rough. Like poll after poll after poll was being produced by the abortion side, showing that now suddenly Americans were in favor of abortion on demand. Um, the optics that the mainstream media created, the narrative that they created their movement, uh, the ones that I saw in my history books when I was growing up, um, they weren't good, right? It was like the old angry white man who's like screaming at the cool young woman with like dyed hair and like a nose ring or something like that. And that's how they defined, you know, pro-life or anti-choice and pro-choice forces. And like that would be like the caption. And anytime there was uh, any article or op-ed written about the pro-life movement, this is this these would be the pictures that they would choose to define uh, our movement. But it didn't stop us. As a pro-life movement, we stayed the course. If you if you don't know anything about pro-lifers, you have to know that we are stubborn SOBs. Like, we are not going to give up. Like, we refuse. We have a mission, and that mission is to make abortion illegal and unthinkable, to eradicate, to abolish abortion. Um, I would say, I could argue, I, th I think intelligently, that the abortion lobby kind of got lazy. Planned Parenthood got lazy, resting on their laurels. They had a president, President Clinton, um, who had large numbers of popularity, had Christian conservatives voting for him, who used the mantra, safe, legal, and rare, which, by the way, we all know that uh, they're very much right now proving that that's not what they're about. Uh, they had a U.S. president doing their dirty work for us. He vetoed the, the partial birth abortion bill twice, despite saying he wanted abortion to be safe, legal, and rare. Um, and they were, I mean, if you look at the 1990s, the polls were disastrous for us. So they kind of got lazy. They kind of started taking that nap. But pro-lifers, thanks to the efforts of, of the greats like you know Nellie Gray and Joe Shiler and Phyllis Shafley, uh, kept at it. I mean, Phyllis Shafley it was a stubborn SOB, if you've ever met her. I love Phyllis. Um, she was a stubborn, stubborn woman. Nellie Gray, same deal. Joe Shiler, who's still alive uh, in Chicago, same deal. Um, 
our movement is still around because they refuse to give up. Because they refuse, whenever the polls would come out or whatever media, media narrative they were, they were creating, they refused to give up. But when people said, shut up, you're the minority, no one wants you, they kept at it. And I think because of them, we are at a very sweet, sweet moment for the pro-life movement today. And it may not feel like it, but I actually think it's good news. You know, we had a poll that we released, um, Students for Life's Institute for Pro-Life Advancement. We released the poll under Institute for Pro-Life Advancement because then you'll trust it more than Students for Life because it says Institute, whatever. Um, it's a branding thing. But so our Institute for Pro-Life Advancement poll, we released the Monday before the March for Life, so going on two and a half weeks ago. Um, and it was fascinating because I wanted to be able to prove uh, with a quantitative poll what we're seeing on campuses you know our fall tour they feel pain tour that visit 115 campuses uh, our just our staff when our staff was on campus with the display we were measuring one in six conversions so one out of every six pro-choice people that the students or the staff spoke to we knew they had changed their minds and it minds change is really actually hard to measure because all of us are stubborn people uh, and so even when you are challenged uh, you don't often admit you're wrong. Like even when my husband challenges me on something, I rarely ever admit that he was right. I may later go, yes, he's right. But to tell him to his face that he was right, that's like a whole different thing. I mean, I give up on certain, I, I found in marriage, I've been married for 13 years, I give up certain things that aren't, that, you know, there's certain things I concede, okay? Um, so I wanted to find a way to poll and show quantitatively what we're seeing on campuses because we can't take all of you, I can't put you in my pocket and like have you witness what we witness on campus. And so I wrote the poll along with the polling company, they, they were my biggest fans over Christmas break, um, about how we have conversations on campuses. And so we asked millennials, 18 to 34, so the biggest voting block, the largest voting block now in America, how they felt about Roe versus Wade, how they felt about Planned Parenthood, how they felt about RU486, which if you don't know, I mean, that's the next battle for the pro-life movement and these medical abortions. And so we asked them how they felt about the about the issue. So the third question was, you know, how do you feel, are you positive or negative against Roe versus Wade and Doe versus Bolton? Well, no surprise there, we lost that question. Then we read out three factual statements about what Roe actually did, and then we re-polled the question. Huge mind shift, huge mind shift. In fact, 51% of millennials, when after reading the three statements, after knowing that Roe versus Wade and Joe versus Bolton allowed for abortion all nine months, for whatever reason, even if the mom doesn't like the gender of the baby, and some taxpayer dollars can be used to pay for abortions or abortion services, after reading those statements, we had 51% of millennials think that Roe versus Wade should be reversed. And that's huge, because if you look at like the Netflix documentary that came out this um this September, there's been all of this kind of, actually Planned Parenthood sent me a fundraising email yesterday saying Roe versus Wade's going to go. Like, this is their big thing. This is their big scare tactic. Like, we have to scare millennials about Roe. Roe can't go because what would our nation look like? I mean, women would be like stuck to go back to the kitchens, have to be barefoot and pregnant. They wouldn't be allowed to have cell phones. There would be no color TV and you couldn't have a job. Like, that is the picture that they paint. That's the picture that they paint. But it's actually not that scary. In fact, when people are told what Roe versus Wade means, they get pissed. They kept, st the, the millennials that we interviewed kept stopping our pollsters because they couldn't believe when we said, even if the mother doesn't like the sex of the baby, they could not believe, and actually we got 54% against Roe on that question, they couldn't believe that mothers could choose to abort the baby simply because they don't like the baby's sex. And we know that happens every single day. Every single day in our country, and it's one of the main drivers of abortion in countries like China and countries like India. We had seven out of 10 millennials want significant restrictions on abortion, like no abortions after the child can feel pain, parental notification, opposition to governmental funding of abortion to taxpayer dollars. Only 7% of the millennials we surveyed lined up with the DNC's position 
on abortion. So the Democratic National Committee actually changed their official platform in 2016 to call for abortion in all nine months for whatever reason and taxpayer funded. Only 7% lined up with the DNC's position. More millennials than not supported Roe versus Wade's reversal. When we asked millennials if they felt they should have a right to vote on abortion policy in their state, which is what will happen when Roe's reverse, right? Abor you know, abortion won't be made illegal. The decision will go back to the state. So it'll be pre-1973. And then we'll work and we'll make it illegal state by state. I'm giving you my plan. That's my nefarious <laughs> plan. They've printed articles like this is, this is their secret agenda. It's not secret. But 65% of millennials said that they thought they should have a right to vote on abortion policy. They should have a right, a right to have to speak up on this. That's huge. 56% oppose selling chemical abortion drugs online or without a doctor's exam, which is something we're facing right now in California. We defeated the bill uh, this year. We're probably going to lose uh, this new session that was just reintroduced. Gavin Newsom, the new governor of California, has pledged to sign to law. Essentially, it's going to dictate that every university, state-funded university, dispense RU486 on college campuses. It's going to turn every college campus in California, a public college campus, into an abortion facility. Radically changing the game. I mean, the pro-abortion governor, Jerry Brown, actually vetoed the law this October. It passed uh, this August using our own talking points, which was a pro-choice talking point of, look, this isn't necessary. That there's an abortion facility within five to seven miles of every college campus in California. So why are you doing this? Why are you taking this risk? Because women die from these abortions. They hemorrhage to death and they have no idea. And the schools aren't equipped. They can't do blood transfusions. They don't even have ultrasounds to make sure that all the parts of the baby have been emptied from the mom's uterus so there can't be a septic or infection. Um, so this is huge. Th these numbers were huge for us. By a three to one margin, 48% to 17% prefer that their tax dollars go to a federally qualified health center, in HHS terms we call FQHC, rather than a Planned Parenthood. And once again, I, I derived this question, I created this question based off what we're seeing on campuses and how we change hearts and minds on campuses. We have a tour called We Don't Need Planned Parenthood, and that's all we do. We simply say, here's the limited amount of services that Planned Parenthood provides. Here's all the services that federally qualified health centers provide. And they, oh, by the way, they serve patients at $40 cheaper per patient, and they serve 20 million more Americans. And if they don't have a service that you need, they're legally obligated to make sure you have transportation to get there. Oh, where would you like your tax dollars to go? Well, no, duh, we win that every single time. It's only the, um, you know, ideologues, usually the adults, the administrators who come in and put their wooden nickels in the Planned Parenthood jar, in the jar. Uh, it's, not, it's not the millennials. So the good news is we're winning, and our poll shows it, and we wrote the poll the way we're having actual conversations with millennials every single day on campus. But there's a lot we have to do. We've got, you know, obviously Capitol Hill, eh, we're not getting anything done. Um, you know, Democrats, Nancy Pelosi's first um, task for reopening government, they put a bunch of money in there for international abortion. That was the first thing that they did. Um, so that's a huge issue. Uh, we've got to continue to push the Trump administration to uphold their promise to defund Planned Parenthood. Their new annual report was released. They always release their annual report when no one's paying attention. So I, everyone was upset about the Covington situation and then Kamal Harris running for president. Guess when Planned Parenthood released their annual report? All the same day. So no one paid attention. Their profits are up 150%. A nonprofit went from profiting, netting, $98 million to over $250 million. Their abortions are up over 4%. All of their services are down. They are an abortion vendor. That is what they do. We have to convince, and this is why I've been having fun meetings with the White House and the administration. Um, by the way, the Secretary of HHS was in a green room with me the other day, and his body man stupidly left him alone with me for like 10 <laughs> minutes. I talked that man's ear off about what he should do. It was brilliant. It was great. Um, it was very easy. Just delist Planned Parenthood as a federal contractor over, over at CMS, Center for Medicaid uh, Services. So there's a lot we have to do. Are you 486? We have to step up on that. Um, this, is, this is the wave. The abortion industry reads the same polls. They know second trimester, third trimester abortions are gone, you, despite of what you're seeing right now in the other states, right? 
So they're trying to get all abortions in the first trimester, and they're trying to get them to be chemical abortions. And they don't need freestanding clinics. You're committing the abortion at home, and you're flushing your child down the toilet. Uh, it's, a, it's actually a, a physically a very tough abortion uh, for women to go through. And Abby Johnson, the new uh, movie coming out unplanned in March about Abby Johnson's conversion, they're the, uh, the most graphic scene, I guess, the most difficult scene in that whole movie is a flashback to her RU486 abortion. Uh, I saw a bunch of people who were scandalized by it, and I, I think we should scandalize a lot more Americans with that scene because that's the reality of RU486 abortion. We're facing social media suppression. You know, Lila, my good friend Lila, her group, Live Action, Susan B. Anthony, we've had our own issues. Uh, you can't get ads up on Twitter. You've got Instagram, Facebook. So they know that we're winning. And so now they're just suppressing our speech. Um, and now we see what's going on in state legislators across the country, right? Uh, governor Cuomo, the governor of New York, was very clear in why they passed the law, uh, which, by the way, elections matter, OK? Uh, they, they, I think they proposed that law bill in like 2011, 2010. It was because of this outcome of this year's elections that they were actually finally able to pass that law. So next time someone's like, I'm pro-life, but I don't, you know, voting pro-life doesn't matter. And just New York is like the number one thing you just get keep throwing in people's face. I will certainly be doing it. Um, Governor Cuomo said the reason why they were passing this bill, legalizing abortion in all nine months of pregnancy for whatever reason, allowing non-doctors to commit abortions in the first trimester, taking away criminal penalties if a woman is pregnant and is harmed assaulted or killed during her pregnancy, it's no longer going to be a criminal pre um, crime. It's not going to be a crime to kill that child. Um, infanticide, they decriminalized the infanticide regulations. Same thing as a gov Governor Northam yesterday in Virginia was ar arguing for that if a baby's born during an abortion, they don't have to give it uh, life-sustaining care because the, suddenly this clump of tissue doesn't really matter if the clump of tissue is outside of the womb. I, that's what they passed in, for, in New York. And Governor Cuomo said the reason they passed is because they're afraid. They're afraid Roe is going to fall. We saw with the Kavanaugh hearings how crazy uh, the left, the pro-abortion left, can be. They've, Planned Parenthood actually has hired a full-time person to prepare for the next Supreme Court opening, and we all know which one that's going to be. And that you've seen nothing. Like, Kavanaugh was nothing compared to what the next Supreme Court opening fight is going to be like. If you don't like conflict, this is not going to be the town for you to be living in because it's going to be crazy. I, I deal with pro-lifers every day, and everyone's like, oh, I just got to love people. I'm like, you can love them, but they're going to be spitting at you while you, you, know, like, you love them. So just be very cautious of that. It's going to be crazy. They know exactly what it is they're fighting for. That's why they're going to New York. That's why they're going to Vermont. There's a bill coming up in Maryland, an amendment. We were there in Rhode Island uh, Tuesday night with another similar New York bill. I mean, obviously, the Virginia bill didn't go anywhere, uh, but now we have them on record. They're going to every state that they can shore up to shore up legal abortion because they're afraid Roe's going to fall. So, I mean, for us and for you, the question is, what do we do? You know, the hair is woken up. The hair is racing towards the finish line, but the hair knows it's behind. Um, there was a Reproductive Health Care Investors Alliance report that was put together last fall that was kind of like this mega SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats, of the abortion landscape and contraceptive landscape in our country. And one of the biggest threats they, they identified was state-level legislation that's been regulating abortion out. And that's why you're seeing this push. But we're winning. We've passed more than 350 pro-life pieces of legislation. They're just now catching up to this. But the hair is sprinting, and the hair is powerful. It's a billion-dollar abortion industry. Planned Parenthood bragged they put more than 20 million just in the midterm elections. They put more than 30 in the 2016 election. I just was reading on Twitter that Cecile Richards, the former president of Planned Parenthood, who's responsible for this mega growth of Planned Parenthood and becoming this political behemoth, her daughter is now a communications director for Kamala Harris. Shock. Just shock. I'm just shocked. So if you, and I, I think this is what's interesting. I've been reading on social media, and people have kind of been saying, this, you know, this legislation proves that we're losing. No, no, no. The pres this, this legislation proves that we're winning. Because they are showing their hands. They're showing their hands. They're showing what the logical conclusion of abortion is. And that's killing born infants. 
It's already been argued in some of the top medical journals. There was a medical journal in Great Britain just a couple years ago. Med the philosophers were saying, well, there's really no difference. So really, we should be ar arguing for infanticide. Peter Singer, Princeton, has openly called for infanticide. He said two years, now he's walked back to be like three months. I guess it keeps him still like in the socially acceptable place to hang out with people because um, he's not a crazy monster, only three months. But this is a logical conclusion of what the abortion industry what they've been advocating for 46 years. So they've showed their hands, they've pulled back the curtain, and they're, they're going crazy because they know they're going to lose. And they're going to their extreme. So I actually think this is a good thing, because if you think that the a billion dollar abortion industry is going to die quietly, is going to cease operations quietly, you haven't been on the streets with us long enough. You haven't seen what it is they're truly about. So now is the time for you to speak up, to fight harder than ever. I know a lot of times we were talking about, you know, Republican Party politics and the GOP ladies societies. And it's always like, we're a big tent. Everyone here can disagree. You know, we don't talk about the social issues. Why the hell not? The Democratic Party demands ideological purity on the issue of abortion. If you don't line up with the DNC on abortion, like, just ask Dan Lipinski what happened to him, the one pro-life Democrat that we have in Congress. They poured millions of dollars in this primary. It was the Susan B. Anthony list and students from Notre Dame University who got their butt into action. That's exactly what happens to you. But the Republican Party, I, we have, in conservative politics, we've made this mistake of saying it's a big tent. We can view abortion however we want. And know what happens? We get what we've been having for the past several years in the US Senate, a Republican Senate, but not a pro-life Senate. And then we can't get anything done. And then millennials, the largest voting bloc in America, who really don't really care about Republicans or Democrats either way, largely are independent, see this, say, well, this is why I don't need to vote for Republicans, because they don't get anything done on this issue. This is my argument time and time again on Capitol Hill. If you have to do something, if you're pro-life, and if you say you're a pro-life party, which now the Republican Party platform is as solid as it's ever been, now is the time to speak up. And you just, you can't, you can't not speak. And I think right now what you're seeing with Governor Northam, what you're seeing with Andrew Cuomo, this is your perfect opportunity at the lunch parties and the dinner parties because they're for infanticide. Who can be for infanticide? And I read you some of the polls. I showed you that, look, we're in the majority on this issue. They are in the extreme minority. They are the extremists. Put them on their guard. You know, a lot of pro-lifers were up in the air about whether or not we would vote for Donald Trump for president. He had no record, you know, as a legislator. He had would openly said he was pro-choice and was like, ah, uh, Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton, we know what Hillary Clinton's going to do. Maybe Donald Trump will be better. Maybe if he doesn't do anything, it's better than Hillary Clinton. We all know. But that third debate, that third debate where President Trump put Hillary Clinton in front of the entire United States to defend partial birth abortion, it got a lot of us, including myself, going, yep, okay, I'm in. I'll do that. So now is the time. You can win on this issue. Our they feel pain tour that we've been taking to college campuses We've been talking about late-term abortions, abortions after the point of a child can scientifically proven to feel pain. When we talk about that issue, we win hands down. So you don't have to be afraid. You can win on this issue. The majority of Americans are with you. And couch it in terms of human rights and justice and fairness and violence. I am for nonviolent health care. They are for violence. They are fundamentally anti-human rights. When we create our abortion museum, the museum to honor the 60 plus million Americans we aborted, where I'm gonna have make sure, as long as I'm alive, I'm gonna make sure that picture of one World Trade Center lit up in pink last week is included in there to show the extremism on a building that has such symbolism for our country, that was a building where so many were martyred a building that actually on the memorial has 11 or 12 pre-born babies listed as the victims of September 11th attack. For them to light up the building pink in honor of infanticide, in honor of legal abortion in all nine months for whatever reason, that's going on in the museum for sure. Questions? <laughs>
Sorry, I didn't have a prearranged talk, so. <laughs> Can I do it here? No, no, no. Okay. He's actually, uh, we're winning in no, in no small part because of you, Kristen. If you would uh, not mind, uh, when you are called on, I'll let you call on people. Sure. Give your name and your school or your affiliation. And uh, let's see, who's got a question? Anyone have questions for me? I'm, I, I usually make at least 25% of the audience angry, so there's got to be. <laughs> I've got a question. Sure. Nobody else is going to jump sure. in. How, how did you, were you always this passionate? And how did you get into, sure. yeah, how did you, did you start students for life? How did you get to where you are? Yeah. I think a lot um, of young people would like to know that. I, I mean, I like to say, like, God put me right where I should be. I was always, like, a bossy person, you know? Like, I used to make my cousins play school with me all summer. Like, they hated summer vacation. And I was, of course, the teacher. I made to do work. Um, so, I mean, that's, like, my, that's my childhood. I was a bossy person. Um, I thought I wanted to be an aeronautical engineer. I actually won a scholarship to space camp. Yes, I have a credit hour, college credit hour in space. Um, something, space philosophy or something. I don't know what they called it. But, um, yeah, so I, I wanted to do that. Um, I wanted to make a lot of money. I started dating my husband when I was 14. He was a senior. I was a freshman. Scandal, I know. So I think he thought, like, he hit the big, big bot. You know, like, we, oh, we were going to make be rolling in it. Yeah, that changed. A uh, woman at my church actually was working as a part-time accountant at a pregnancy resource center. And she asked me to come volunteer with her. And I needed credit hours because I was a classic overachiever. And I, I graduated high school and college early. So I had to do like 150 credit hours of volunteer work, like 150 hours in one summer. So I was like, sure. You're like, I love women. Um, I'll do it. Yeah, it was a pregnancy resource center. Um, and so I had always kind of grown up in a pro-life home. I think if you would have asked me, though, I probably would have said I was pro-choice because that was like more the politically acceptable thing to do. And I always had those like what if questions or what if she's raped or what if I'm raped. Um, and so it, I was very fortunate because when I went to the pregnancy center, uh, the woman at the center, I mean, yes, I did the, like the manual labor and I found the old computer and taught them how to make their newsletter and reorganize the supply room and the diapers. But they also trained me. Um, to counsel the women who are coming into the center who are my age or younger. So I was, like, stuck in a room for, like, two weeks watching and reading everything I could get my hands on about abortion. And so um, take this bossy personality coupled with this realization that, oh, my gosh, this is happening, but yet no one ever talks about this. Uh, yeah, you didn't want to be around me for about two years. Um, I became that person who, like, every boy I went, I had the pro-life T-shirt, I had the pro-life stickers, my car was the pro-life mobile. I had the fetal miles in my purse, which I still carry, which, by the way, that's a really weird feeling because I have fetal miles, and then you, like, put your hand, and you're like, what is squishy? And it's a fetal mile. It's, we did a funny video. Only pro-lifers would get it. Um, <laughs> So I became that really aggressive, like, did you know abortion's happening? I mean, like, people saw me coming. I started a pro-life group in my high school. Uh, that got me involved in politics because I saw, wow, we can save a lot of babies. It's not, politics isn't the final solution to ending abortion. It, it's part of the solution. It's a part. Um, and so I got involved in politics and protested a bunch of people. Um, and then, um, yeah, I started a pro-life group in my college, and that's how I worked for the I got involved with the President Bush campaign as an intern. They hired me a couple weeks on, so I took off a semester and got here and then uh, worked at the RNC for a few months, and I thought I was going to love it, hated it, because I was, like, one of, like, two pro-lifers in my division. Um, so I went to the HHS because I thought, well, what does a pro-lifer do? They open up a pregnancy center. But I need money to do that, so I need to go start getting a job. Um, and then a friend called and said, hey, there's a bunch of students that want to start a full-time student pro-life organization. Um, and I always felt like kind of I was alone. I was always recreating the wheel in my high school and my college, not really knowing what I was doing, just kind of just doing what I could. Um, I never thought to, like, go to Google and, like, type in, like, pro-life students to see if there were others of us. Like, I went to the National Rights Life Conference, and there were, like, 15, and I was like, holy cow, there's 15. This is amazing. Um, so I had no idea. Uh, that there were others like me. So, yeah, so we launched Students for Life in 2006, and basically most of our programs were everything I did wrong, uh, and we tried to fix them. So, yeah. yeah. Any other questions? I don't, I don't know. Everyone did their hands at the same time. Okay, yeah. you go first, then you, then you, then you, and then you. They're like, what? 
Thank you so much for your talk. I was not in the 25% that did not appreciate what you said. Okay. You're amazing. Um, so my name is Kelly Clemente. I'm a faith-based adoption advocate and very pro-life. Um, but I have a question, and I've also volunteered at Crisis Pregnancy Center, so I appreciate the work that you did there. Um, but I have noticed that there is a difference between um, being you know, outwardly pro-life with someone that comes to you at a crisis pregnancy center and you're sharing with her the... Um, you know, what abortion really is and a friend. And I have, you know, friends of mine who've come to me that said that they're considering abortion. Do you have any advice um, to some women in this room? You know, as we know, one in four women um, have abortions. So how can we as pro-life women um, talk to our friends about this that are considering abortion? Yeah. I mean, when I was writing my book, um, I'm trying to write another one, but it's going to take forever because I just don't have the time. Like I start, I'm like, oh, um, when I was writing the, my book, we interviewed students, and I interviewed students who had been faced with a crisis pregnancy situation uh, or had been directly involved in a situation on campus. And it was interesting because every student I, I interviewed who chose abortion, who, all funda- who ultimately at the end of, of everything that they went through chose abortion, it was because they didn't have somebody. Every student who chose abortion, it didn't matter what kind of circumstances they were in, Every student who ultimately chose life was because they had somebody. It was fascinating where it was just they found one person to say, you know you don't have to do this. Because the the thought process, especially of a student who's in high school, who was in college, is this has to be done. Like there's no way I can stay in school. Uh, there's no way I can be a student and a mom. Uh, the, the girls, the young women who chose life, it was just because one person said they weren't overtly like, don't do this, your baby has a heartbeat. Um, it was, you know you don't have to do this. And I thought that that was really enlightening to me because it spoke to what we see so often in front of the uh, Planned Parenthoods and the abortion facilities of no woman ever goes to a Planned Parenthood thinking that like she's exercising some great choice. Like no one's excited to have their abortion, Right. She's there because she feels like she's run out of choices, that this is her only option left. It's her or the baby, and she has to choose which life. Uh, And so she knows it's a life. Um, And so I I thought that was really striking of when you have a friend, when you know someone who's going through this, being that person to say, you don't have to do this, and do you know there's all these resources? Um, That's usually what works on campuses when our students save lives. I I think you had a question. Yeah, Yeah. And then you, I'm not, I'm not favoring what's out of the room, sorry. Thank you so much. I can feel like your excitement radiating off. Like I think everyone feels that way. Uh, my name is Brianna and I, I work here at Heritage. Um, I'm wondering, I've heard kind of the tone of the pro-choice movement sure. changing their, um, their branding to being that of reproductive freedom. Yeah. And I think that branding is, is honestly super offensive to women who are having such a hard time conceiving and trying to have children for years. Um, I'm wondering if you can maybe touch on what you kind of think and what you could see Students for Life doing in the future to to combat this kind of domination of the women's rights. Yeah, I mean, they don't actually even use the word pro-choice themselves anymore. So Planned Parenthood in 2014, we were undercover at one of our things, and they actually instructed their affiliates not to use the word pro-choice because when they're polling pro-choice, it's too associated with the word abortion. And they read the same polls that we do. I mean, t- the top of the mind word association, when you hear the word abortion, you think of death, killing, sadness. And so that's why they've gone to reproductive health and reproductive freedom because they actually don't want to even use the word pro-choice because it's too close to the word ab- abortion. Um, and so we just need to keep calling them on it. Um, so, example, like when I was at Gonzaga a couple, well, December, I was arguing with this totally crazy person. Um, but I was, I was, I got her after 10 minutes to admit, uh, yes, she was pro-abortion. I said, well, I'm anti-abortion, so you must be pro-abortion. No, I'm not pro-abortion. I was like, well, do you believe abortion should be legal? Yes. I said, great. So then you're pro-abortion. No, I'm not pro-abortion. It's like, what are you afraid of? Own your damn label. I'm going to make stickers. I'm going to make our staff do this. They don't know this yet. 
Um, but I'm going to make I'm anti-abortion and I'm pro-abortion because I'm actually okay using those labels. I'm okay being labeled anti-abortion. I actually refer to myself as anti-abortion more than I refer to myself as pro-life because on campuses there's always like, well, what's the pro-life? And the left has done a very good job. The evangelical left has done a very good job. Jim Wallace, Sojourners, those folks to say, oh, pro-life is 25 different issues. Wendy Davis, the woman who filibustered against the paying cable bill in Texas, actually had the audacity to say she was pro-life. And so we haven't fought enough for that term. And, and as a consequence, it's gotten very muddy. So I actually use anti-abortion. I'm like, I'm anti-smoking. Like, I hate smoking. Do not come up to me or be near my children with a cigarette. I'm anti-sex trafficking. I'm anti-child labor. Like, I'm okay being anti. I, somehow in the pro-life movement, we're like, we have to be pro. We have to be for. I'm like, no. Ah. Abortion's a bad thing. It's okay that I'm anti it. Um, so I think that's important as we call it on them. I think when you're talking about, I don't know if you saw the Fox News clip. Um, uh, I think it was Wednesday. I forget what day today is. Today's Thursday, right? I think it was yesterday or Tuesday. The Fox News host talked about the Virginia bill and started tearing up, talking about her friends who were having fertility problems. And I think this is a great way to start saying they're killing infants they're about killing babies because i think it speaks to so many people who are struggling with infertility who are on the adoption list who have been waiting for five years to adopt does that help and you, right, all right, all right. she goes next sorry my name's Jordan. Um, I see a handful of men in the room at this conservative women's network. Uh, Thank you for meetings. being so brave and being here. My question is, what do you say to men who are afraid to speak up because this is a women's issue and we have no right yeah. to talk about a women's issue? Well, it's not a women's issue. This is a human rights issue. That's like your five-second rebuttal to any idiot on a campus. <laughs> and by the way, most of the time the people are yelling at me about this issue, they are men yelling at me about this issue. I mean, it's hilarious. Somehow you can be a man and you can be for abortion and it's socially acceptable, but if you're a man and you're pro-life, it's not. This isn't a women's issue. It's not a men's issue. It's a fundamental human rights issue. And oh, by the way, arguments don't have genders. Does that help you? That's like a fast... I thank you so much for your talk. I've loved hearing from you. I'm Anna. I'm an intern with the Family Research Council. And uh, one of the things that I would just love to hear your thoughts on are how do we have, like, how do we how do we have pro-life conversations with our friends, our families, our acquaintances? How do we let people know we're pro-life? And speak into a culture of life without being over the top and pushing them away from us? Like, sure. how do you walk that line? I don't walk it real well. <laughs> so you're asking a really difficult question to me because I'm like the worst person ever to invite to any dinner party. Uh, I mean, obviously you can do the passive aggressive thing of just put a ton of pro-life bumper stickers in your car, show up at a family function, and somebody is going to call you on it. And so, oh, you saw this. And then, then you can actually respond because you didn't bring it up. They brought it up. Um, so you can be passive aggressive like that. I lived in the Midwest for past four years, so I'm learning Minnesota nice. Um, so there's that. Um, obviously, I think a lot of us have conversations with our family members on Facebook and social media. I think it's about sharing. Be careful of like what you're sharing, but I think be intentional. Like, like, oh, I'm gonna show this video of this abortionist, you know, who's not graphically but very descriptively describe what happens in abortion. That's gonna get people in your family talking. I think you have a lot of tools where you can kind of start the conversation without walking up to somebody and say, "Hey, Aunt Jean, I heard you voted for um, Clinton. Let me tell you why you're wrong." I mean, I've done that, but it you know, starts off the conversation not in a great way. So I think there's things you can do, the way you live your life, the events that you attend. Like if you're at the March for Life, post the picture of you holding a pro-life sign. Make that your profile picture on social media. People will ask you, uh, and they're going to want to know. And I think it's good, too, because, you know, when I was in college, like I had the pro-life mobile and I had all my little bumper stickers. But anytime there was any debate in a class on campus about abortion, I knew it happened because everybody came to me. I went to small schools and I could look 1,100 of us. But, I mean, it was very clear, like, they all, they didn't agree with me. But they were all like, so what would you say about this? Or I'm writing a paper about abortion. I'm like, oh, let me show you my fetal models. I mean, like, I, so um, I think there's ways you can do it more subtly. I, I do think, though, um, I think it's about your personal witness and who you are. 
I think that's a, you know, we have a training of students who I've called DBW, don't be weird. Um, and so it's, it's a very real training we have in the pro-life movement. Um, like, who do we put in front, like, if you ever see me at the Supreme Court, like, in front, um, well, if you're a heritage intern, you'll probably see me one next time because I'll probably be recruiting you. Um, but I'm very intentional about who I put in front of the cameras. And, like, you will literally see me pushing people out of the way. And, like, people hate me because I'm like, get out of the picture. Um, so I'm very, like, intentional about who I put out front. And that's what we always tell our students with life groups, too. Like, don't put the weird people manning your table. Get, put the more popular people at your table. And <laughs> there's a place for all of us in the pro-life movement, even us weird people. Uh, but, th you know, there's places there's places for us. So I think I think you just have to be intentional. Who are you talking to? Um, but honestly, I think a lot of, it's like it's like your Christianity, right? Like, what's one of the best ways to talk about your faith. I mean, you work at Family Research Council, so yes, I am assuming you're a Christian. Um, the, one of the best ways I know to evangelize about my faith is the way I live my life. Does that help? Any other questions? Hi, my name is Elena. Um, I'm a part of Let Them Live, and we went to Ireland this summer. Um, and one of the things that was one of the most shocking is that the Catholic Church and just uh, a lot of the Christian faith just kind of yep. turned their back towards mm -hmm. the entire referendum and didn't advocate for anything. So my question is that it also translates to here in the United States. How do we um, counteract the growing apathy and um, just the unwillingness to talk about the issue even sure. within the Christian faith? Yeah, I mean, I was we had a team in Ireland as well. Um, I was over there in October. I keynoted one of their conferences, and I'm doing an event with them Saturday, and it's bad. It's really bad. I was just on the phone with them yesterday, Skyping, and it's not good. The challenge with Ireland, it, you know, it's a little bit of a different story, too, because they had the sexual abuse scandal that rocked Ireland, um, and the way the Irish Catholics kind of they kind of retreated in on themselves instead of speaking out. They denounced it, but instead of speaking out being more vocal, they kind of, so now it's like no one wants to say that they're Catholic um, because of the scandal. And I'm like, no, you just be like, that person's a predator who deserves to spend the rest of their life in prison. That person doesn't represent Christianity. Like, it's very simple to do. Like, um, But the, it was. It, I think it has to do a little bit with the way they responded to this crisis in the church as to why it's so bad right now. With, with and, and that was the question, like, should Pope Francis go to Ireland? Because he went to Ireland after the vote. I thought he should go for it, but then the thought was, a lot of people were like, well, he shouldn't go to Ireland until after the vote because it could actually hurt the vote if he shows up. I don't really think that was true, but I think that was a miscalculation. I think uh, when we talk about the, the churches here in the United States, um, <laughs> you can see Protestantism. Andrew knows what I'm going to say. I mean, I I left Protestantism. I'm a Catholic, um, and one of the reasons I converted and entered the church, um, and I'm like a rebel, so I still have like problems with church hierarchy. I'm still like, please tell me how am I supposed to be okay with this? This bishop's a jerk. Like, why do I? Have but anyway, um, I'm bad Catholic. I'm a baby Catholic, so it's excusable. But um, because I got so fed up with the Protestant church and not take a stand. And, and I had a great Protestant church where I grew up in West Virginia. I love my church family in West Virginia. But when I moved to DC, I just never could find it. I could never find a church that was like, okay, good on abortion, good on marriage. Like I, and it started a lot of questions as to like, why can't I find a church that actually agrees with me? I'm like, oh, because there's not one doctrine. Um, so that was my solution, but, and still within the Catholic church, it's a huge problem though. We have the older priests, the JP, you know, the, the Vatican II priests, I would say, are our biggest problems. Like the older, you know, Father Fleglers and things like that. The younger priests tend to be better on this issue. I would say, as a Christian, if you are a Christian, um, you need to be the thorn in your pastor or your priest's side. You have to be talking about it because they don't want to talk about it. Um, when we have enough money, in maybe 10 years, we'll see, we, Students for Life, it's part of our strategic plan. We're actually going to launch full-time regional coordinators just on Bible school campuses and in seminaries because this is a huge problem. You, you know, pastors, ministers, youth ministers, they aren't being prepped to talk about. So they're always like, they don't really know how to talk about the issue of abortion. And so they're like afraid, like, you know, they know that there's women in the church who are hurting from abortion. So they don't want to say anything that's going to hurt her. 
but then they don't really know how to talk about it. There's also the more pragmatic, you know, problem of if you talk about it, you may lose parishioners, you may lose members, you may lose money. And so that's actually an, an, a real problem. So we actually need to do a better job of teaching pastors, teaching priests how to talk about the issue. And you can do that as a lay person speaking into your pastor, speaking into your priest, saying, hey, do you know January's Respect Life or October's Respect Life Month or January there's Respect Life Week? Like, we need to do something. You know, can I have a table? Can I do a table about Rachel Vineyard, you know, Rachel's Vineyard, post-abortion healing ministries? Or can we do a baby ball drive for the local pregnancy center? So you can do that in your church. A lot of Catholic church have, like, respect life groups. Other Protestant churches have other groups. They work with the local right to lives. Uh, we have a program at Students Life called Church Captains where I just try to get our donors, our supporters, who say, all right, I've given you all I can give. What more I can do? And I'm like, get active in your church. You know, bring pro-life speakers into the youth groups into the Bible studies, um, but you have to be that person pushing in your church. And I think that's what's so great when you look at the American pro-life movement as opposed to like the Canadian pro-life movement, and we work with the Canadians a lot, is pro-lifers in America, like, like I said, we are stubborn SOBs. Like we refuse to give up. We will not cower. And so we will be those annoying people. We will continue to fight. And that's what's so amazing about Americans in general. Like we're willing to speak out. The Canadians are like, oh, well, it's not polite, and like, I don't want to ruffle any feathers. I'm like, what are you talking about? Babies are dying. Who cares if your neighbor is upset with you? Like, so that's what you have to be willing to be. You kind of have to be willing to be that person. Does that help you? Sorry. Once again, see, so promise I'd make like support of the room mad. Any other? Sorry, my hair is so bad. I had to do it in DCA airport. And I had to go stand and maybe stand in front of the Capitol and record a video for an hour. It's bad. Hi, I'm Catherine Zimmerman. I'm sorry I was late. Um, parking was atrocious. Um, but I wanted to um, just touch on what you had just said about uh, people uh, speaking and quieting our voice. And want you to kind of address that a little bit more because uh, I feel... Uh, many times that when I bring up the subject that I'm quickly cut down with uh, uh, comments that uh, are, feel like bullying and do you get this question a lot? Well, we see it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, I'd like to know some different techniques to use and see if you have sure. anything, you know, that we can use, that we can talk about with our mm -hmm. youth at our church. Uh, with the church. Um, I think one of the things that we try to instill in our students for life members um, is training in apologetics, pro-life apologetics, because I feel like when you're having a difficult conversation with somebody, then they're going to shut you down. What about rape? You don't care about women have been raped? That's heartless. And then they walk away and you're like, uh, how do I answer that question in 30 seconds without sounding like a jerk, right? Um, I think the more you know and the more you study in pro-life apologetics, I think that actually increases your level of courage um, to just be like, oh, wait a minute. And sometimes, like, I'll find myself, like, I'll be in a debate with a student on campus, and a student will say something, and, like, something will come out of my mouth. I'm like, that was fantastic. I had no idea. And I'm literally just regurgitating something I heard, like, I didn't even think about. I always call it, like, a Holy Spirit movement, but if you're not religious, whatever, it is a quinky dink. Um, <laughs> so I think... I think for our students, we find that once they do a couple of a pro-life apologetics courses, we work with a group called Equal Rights Institute that has a course online that your youth group could go through. And week by week, they go through, you know, biology and the ph philosophy, and then they go over the hard questions and, the, you know, the bodily timely questions. Because I think once you feel equipped to answer the questions, you're, when someone tries to shut you down, you go, uh-uh, uh-uh. That's not fair. Arguments don't have gender. Next. And you call them on it, right? You call them on it and say, no, I'm not going to let you go there. Um, other things we've done, there's a book called um, Pro-Choice. I'm sorry. Steve Wagner wrote it. I can see it. It's in my office. Something Common Ground. And Steve Wagner wrote it. He worked for Justice for All. You can Google it. But um, not your Steve Wagner. Another <laughs> Steve Wagner. It's spelled differently. Uh, um, but... It's interesting because what he does in his uh, apologetics approach on campuses was he builds common ground with pro-choice individuals. So I was like, fine, you're for legal abortion. Okay, how do you feel about abortion being used as birth control? 
are you okay with a woman having like 15 abortions? Like, and people are like, no, absolutely not. Okay, great, we agree. And what he does is, is as quickly as possible try to find common ground, and then he gets down to the harder questions and the fundamental question. I think the one thing you have to understand is fundamentally, at the end of the day, no matter what arguments you hear, no matter what they yell at you or curse at you, the bottom line question in a pro-life movement is what is it? That's the fundamental question. Because they truly do not believe that what is inside her is unique, whole, living human person that's never existed before and will never exist again. It has its entirely new genetic code that's never existed on this earth. They don't actually believe that. And when they have to admit that, it destroys their entire argument or they end up sounding like a eugenicist. They sound like Governor Northam. And it shows the flaws of their movement. Right. You, awesome. you have passed on this passion <laughs> to all of good, us. Good, good. Thank you so much. Thank you. We have a couple of gifts too. Have a gift. Here oh. you go. We have our uh, oh, I love purple. limited edition Claire Booth Loose coffee mug with her famous saying, No good deed goes unpunished. And a tote bag. Awesome. To carry all your gifts. Yes, thank you. <laughs> and well, in this Oh my gosh. Warm in this uh, cold, very cold Arctic vortex that we've got going here, we have a, um, a heritage um, item to keep you warm. Um, I want to thank you for being such an incredible warrior uh, for such an important issue. And I want to invite everybody to join us for lunch and we can continue the conversation with Kristen and with each other back in our Shaw conference room. And thanks to everybody who's joined us online uh, for viewing. So thanks again and uh, we look forward to seeing you at the next CWM. Thank you. Thank you.